you're sequencing correctly, quantum numbers should be something you learn directly after light. Light is kind of how we see what's going on within an atom because the components of an atom we're not actually able to see. They're too tiny to interact with visible light. So there's no way for us to really track them except by viewing what types of light uh, are emitted from an atom or from an electron and, and how light interacts with those things. So quantum numbers really is being able to kind of describe how electrons are moving and then information comes from the types of light that comes off of them or gets absorbed by them or interacts with them. So frequently in quantum numbers, we start by talking about things like wave functions and orbitals. And so just as a precursor here, understanding that an orbital is not an actual thing. There's no orbitals in, a, in an atom. They are, they are human constructs, they're mathematical descriptions that we use to describe what an electron is doing. They're very useful because we can use them mathematically to get information about the electron, but really we've constructed this idea, so we're kind of implementing this orbital state and then getting our information from that mathematics. And so there's limitations to what we actually know about what the electron is doing within an atom. There's not a clear picture of how the electron moves within an atom, okay? But let's go ahead and go through then, once we have these orbitals, what they are and what they aren't. So you've probably seen pictures that look something to this nature. And anytime you see an orbital picture like this, where it's an enclosure, it's a balloon, it's, 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 a, it's a drawing where the electron is within this range, that's not a good drawing because really that's kind of suggesting that the electron is bound to this space. And really that's not what this is. A better picture is something that's got the fuzziness to it where you get the idea that this is telling us likely where we are to find the electron within its motion around the atom. And an even better picture is one like this that is actually the mathematical function that we've started with. This is the construction of our orbital here. And so we can see in there where the electron is not going to exist, where it's unlikely to exist, where it's most likely to exist. And then we'd have to think a little bit on the geometry of how to turn this function into this particular three-dimensional representation to indicate what's going on with the electron. Here we can see that as I'm moving away, I have kind of a minimal likelihood of seeing it all of a sudden that kind of maximizes. Then I have a node, and then as I get further away, all of a sudden it becomes really likely that I'll find the electron there. In a 3S orbital, I have a couple of those as I move away. So we can get into radial and angular nodes and all of those features of orbitals. But really, quantum numbers is us taking that mathematical function and then deriving information from it. So we can do operations on these things that allow us to tell things about them. And there are four really important quantum numbers in regular chemistry. So the first one is called the principal quantum number. Its symbol is N. And it tells you what energy level there is of the electron. So, so we can use the Hamiltonian operator here to come up with this. And for here, we have N equals two. That would mean that the electron is in the second energy level available to that electron. Okay. Now, some important things for everyone to know about N is that there's a kind of a interesting thing where N starts in the first energy level, the next energy level is so much higher up, but after that, the energy levels quickly start to get closer and closer together, and then they start to kind of approach zero. And so you can see that here in this diagram, or you can kind of see this here in the drawing, here's N equals one and two and three, four, five, six. If I had N equals 10, it would still be very close to N equals six, in fact, the drop from 2 to 1 is greater than the drop from infinity down to 2. So the spacing becomes very, very close. In infinity here, we're getting to zero energy of interaction between the uh, electron and the nucleus at that point. At that point, we've removed the electron. So n is infinity, is infinity would be the ionization energy to move from infinity down to 1, would be how much energy it takes to remove that electron, unless we're looking at a electron not in hydrogen where it's somewhere in a higher up level. Okay. okay, so N tells us our energy level. We've seen that in Bohr model and in the past, so we're somewhat familiar with that. The other three ones are, are somewhat new. So there are two angular momentum quantum numbers. The first one is, is the angular quantum, angular momentum number, L, and that, that's gonna be used to indicate for us what type of orbital we're using. So if L comes out to zero when we do our calculation, that means that we're going to describe that electron's existence and, and motion using an s orbital. Uh, if l is equal to 1, we're going to use a p orbital. If l is 2, a d orbital. l is 3, is an f orbital. After that, it does continue on into theoretical orbitals that 
we don't see in the ground state of atoms at this point, that there would be an alphabetical order from F. So G, then H, and then I, and so on. Okay. The magnetic quantum number is the other one. This is also an angular momentum number. Now, the way I like to think about this is I like to think of P orbitals. So in a P set of orbitals, we have, let's call it a PX, PY, and then we have a PZ coming into and out of the board. If I set up a magnetic field that goes in a certain direction, so here's my magnetic field coming into here, it's going to interact differently with this than it will with this. And so we can use that to differentiate these, these quantum states that the electron is kind of being occupied with. And so m orbital will tell you, the m, m net quantum number will tell you which specific orbital we're in. And so in a P set of orbitals, we often represent those with three lines that are equal in energy. Well, in a magnetic field, this one might be different in energy than these two. And so M is our representation of which of those three there are. Now, our way of numbering them is we start with M equal to zero, and then we go up and down by ones. So for P orbitals, we have a minus one, a zero, and a plus one. For a set of D orbitals, we have five degenerate orbitals. So we start at zero, and then we go up to two, and down to negative two. And for F orbitals, we go from negative three to positive three. Now what some people do then is they say, well, there's a relationship between M and L, right? For L is equal to um, one, we go for an M of negative one to positive one. For L is equal to 2, our M goes from negative 2 to positive 2. So really, we could say that our M values are going to be from negative L to positive L for whatever type of orbital we're describing. For L equals 0, we're in an S orbital. There's just 0 for the M state. And then the last one is our spin. Um, and spin is an intrinsic type of spin. There's, there's some discussion on what it actually is, but I think this is a fair enough at this point to call it that. Uh, and it's, a, it's an angular momentum again, and there are only two different values for it for an electron. It's plus one half and minus one half. Okay, and so again, we can affect these spins using the magnetic field, and we can differentiate between the two. And really, there's nothing really big to kind of describe spin with, but spin is important for kind of going along with all the rules that govern quantum mechanics. So let's look at those for a little bit so we can talk about the spin. So there are three key rules that we'll, we'll see in introductory chemistry. There's the off ball principle, there's Hund's rule, and there's the Pauli exclusion principle. So the first one, the off ball principle is this, that if you have a whole set of orbital states or, or certain ways in which the electron will move and exist in an atom, that the one that is lowest in energy will get occupied first. So if I have a 1s, 2s, and 2p set of orbitals available for occupation by an electron, the electron will go into the 1s orbital first. It will then go into, the second one will go into the 1s before we go to the 2s. Okay. Now when I'm drawing an arrow there, that's representing an electron. The arrow pointing up is representing one spin state, and the arrow pointing down is representing the other spin state. The line here is representing my mathematical calculation of the energy of the orbital. All right. So really what I'm saying here is I have four electrons. These two are moving in one particular path, and, and not path, but a manner around the atom. These two are moving in a different manner around the atom, and existing in a different kind of position in general around the atom. Um, and then these two are the same type of path or position or motion, but they have opposing spins. So their intrinsic angular momentum is different. Okay. Now the Hund's rule comes up because electrons repel each other. So when I go into the 2p state here and start to put electrons in, when I put the first electron in, the next one is not going to pair up with it because that would be two electrons really in close vicinity. So rather, the next one goes into the next unoccupied orbital, it's degenerate. And I do that until I filled all three. At that point, I can begin pairing because it takes less force or energy to pair those electrons than it does to put one into the next energy state, the 3s. That's not always the case, but usually it's the case. And then I could go ahead and continue filling these up. So Hund's rule is the electrons will not pair in a set of degenerate orbitals, which means equal in energy, to all of them are half filled. The final rule is called the Pauli Exclusion Principle. It's named after Mr. Principle. 
And this is that no two electrons can have the same set of quantum numbers. Now in chemistry, we reduce that to saying only two electrons per orbital, and they need to have opposing spins. Now if we look at all of our quantum number stuff, in, a, in an orbital state, we have a certain n, a certain l, a certain m, and x. These are our four quantum numbers. And so if our four quantum numbers are all the same, that would violate this. So the way we phrase that is saying, okay, well, for a given n, for a given l, and for a given m, I can have two electrons, and they have to have opposing spins. So that meets the criteria of the original statement, but it allows us to describe it in a little more easily visualized manner. And so when we have these sets of orbitals here, we can have two electrons if they're opposing spins, because then they have one of their quantum numbers different. If I go to put a third electron in, then, then all four of the quantum numbers for two of the electrons will be the same. And that's the violation of Pauli's exclusion principle. So here we have some quantum number stuff that we can break down. Here I've got Sulfur's electron configurations, and I want to know what are the quantum numbers for the final four electrons, the three P4. So for, I'm going to have four sets of quantum numbers for an N, an L, an M, and an S. Okay. So a good way to do this is to draw the orbital diagram. So we have three, three p orbitals here in the three third energy level. And we have four electrons, so we're going to fill them in like this. So our n for all of these is the same. They're all in the third energy level. Right? The l is also the same. They're all in a p orbital. So for p orbital, l would be equal to one. And then the m, we have a little bit of differentiation. So we get to pick how these are assigned. It's not like this is always minus one, and this is always zero, and this is plus one. We can choose any way we want, because really, we're in 3D space. We can just rotate if we need to to get whatever direction we want. But let's go ahead and do this a little mixed up just to kind of illustrate that. So let's assign our m values like that. So then for our first electron here, we have m is equal to zero, and it's spin up. So let's give it a plus one. The second one is also an m equal to zero, but it's the opposite spin, minus one. In this orbital, we have m equal to plus one, I'm sorry, in this, in this electron here, third electron, and it's spin up, so let's call it plus one half. And then the last one is in the m equals minus one fate, and it would be plus one half. So that would be the four sets of quantum numbers. Now, if I were to go through and say, well, what about the three s? Well, for those, n would still be three, L would now be zero, because it's an S orbital. M would have to be zero, we'd have no option. And the spin would either be plus or minus one half. Okay. If we look down below, here we have the third energy level, and we have five degenerate orbitals. That's indicating that these are D orbitals. So we have three D orbitals. So if I want the quantum numbers for these electrons, let's just pick a couple here. So we have N is equal to three. We have L will be two, because it's a D orbital state. And then the m, we have any number available between negative 2 and positive 2. So let's just do them in order, negative 2 to positive 2. And then the spin, I have the first electron is spin up, plus 1 half. The next electron would be the exact same thing, except it would be minus 1 half. Okay. This electron would be n equals 3, l equals 2, but now we're in a different m state. This one would also be a different m state. Likewise, and the last one also. If we had to add another electron to this, some things we know is it's going to go into either negative one, zero, plus one, or plus two m orbital, and also the spin is going to have to be negative one half. Okay. If we look over here in blue, I've drawn one s three. What rule does that violate? Is the question I was going for. And so what we see here is that we violated the Pauli exclusion principle. We have more than two electrons in the same orbital, which means we have two electrons that have the same four quantum numbers, and that's a violation. Down here in green and black, I've got an orbital diagram, 1s, 2s, 3s, 2p empty. And the question is, what does that violate? And this would violate the off ball principle. Uh, and the reason, and so anytime you have an electron in an excited state, that is a violation of the off ball principle. That's a temporary thing that's going to go back to fixing itself pretty, pretty soon. Um, 
but that is a violation of Aqba. Aqba would have this electron down in the 2s state. A uh, common multiple choice question will list things like this. So if we were to write the electron configuration here, this is our violation of the Aqba principle. If I wanted to violate Hund's rule, I would come over here, let's fill this up, and go to the 2p, and I would pair these up before I filled up the entire thing. And then we would be violating the Hund's rule. 